Hello, friends and family. We are so glad you've joined us for our second lesson, our second week on our third quarter of 2024. We're studying the Gospel of Mark, and our second lesson is entitled, A Day in the Ministry of Jesus. We want to remind you before we get started that you can get the notes, all of our, our in-depth and maybe not so in-depth notes from the Sabbath School panel. And you can do that by emailing your request to ssp at 3abn.org. Am I right about that? Right. ssp at 3abn.org. Everyone agrees with me. That's where you need to send your, your request. And you need to make sure you email it. Don't go online. Don't go to the website. Don't call. Email your request, ssp at 3abn.org. Before we get started, let me introduce uh, the panel for today's lessons. To my immediate uh, left is my brother in Christ, Daniel Perrin. I have Monday's lesson, which is called an unforgettable worship service. All right. And to your left is my sister in Christ, Jill Marconi. Thank you, Pastor James. On Tuesday, we look at more Sabbath ministry. All right. And then to your immediate left, my sister in Christ, Shelley Quinn. Oh, I have Wednesday's lesson, and it is the secret of Jesus' ministry. And finally, at the end, we have my brother in Christ, Ryan Day. Amen. Thursday's lesson entitled, Can You Keep a Secret? Mm, all right. That sounds very interesting. Before we get started, we want to go to the Lord in prayer. Shelley, would you like to have our prayer for us? Mm, yes. Our loving Heavenly Father, how grateful we are for this opportunity to get into your word. Thank you for those who have tuned in. Mm -hmm. We pray, Father, that as we review and dive into this scripture, please, Lord, let it sink deeply into our hearts and help us to put it into action. Mm -hmm. We pray for the leading of your Holy Spirit for us and for all who are tuned in. In Christ we pray. Amen. 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 A day in the ministry of Jesus. Now, the Sabbath school for this quarter, excuse me, for this week is going to direct us to a number of scripture verses. We're going to be looking at Mark 1, 16 through 45. That's quite a bit. John 1, 29 to 42. And then Mark 5, 41, Luke 6, verse 12, and Leviticus 13. Now, we're going to be covering a lot of those scriptures as we go through the panel this morning. But our memory text is found in Mark chapter 1 and verse 17. Mark 1 and verse 17. Then Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And that's the New King James Version. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. You know, each gospel introduces the beginning of the ministry of Jesus in a particular way. You know, Mark, Matthew, Luke, John, they all have a different take on the beginning of the ministry of Jesus Christ. Matthew presents Jesus as calling the disciples and then preaching the Sermon on the Mount. That's how he begins his ministry according to the Gospel of Matthew. Luke tells the story of Jesus' inaugural sermon on a Sabbath in the synagogue in Nazareth. And then we have John. He recounts the calling of some of the early disciples and the wedding at Cana where Jesus performs his first miracle or sign. The Gospel of Mark, the one that we're studying, recounts the calling of the four disciples and describes a Sabbath in Capernaum and what followed. That's how Mark introduces the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now this Sabbath with Jesus at the very beginning of Mark gives the reader a sense of who Jesus is. In the entire section for this week's lesson, there are very few of his words that are recorded. There's a brief call to discipleship, a command to a demon, a plan to visit other locations, and the healing of a leper, leper with instructions to show himself before the priest to be clean. The emphasis is on action. Yeah. And that is just the way Mark does his gospel. The emphasis is on action particularly healing people. The gospel writer likes to use the word immediately, immediately. That's just a word that Mark uses again and again and again. And he uses that to illustrate the fast action movement of Jesus' ministry. So if you were to summarize uh, the gospel of Mark, it would be an action uh, type uh, gospel emphasis. I was going to use the phrase, you know, an action, uh, you know, movie or whatever, but we're not talking about movies right now. We're talking about the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Now, in Sunday's lesson, the, the lesson is entitled, Follow Me. And we want to read Mark chapter 1, verses 16 through 20, and ask the question or answer the question, who were the men Jesus called as disciples and what was their response? Mm -hmm. 
So who are these men and what was their response? So let's begin here in Mark chapter 1 and verse 16. Now, as he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, his brother, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishers. And Jesus said unto them, Come ye after me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And straightway they forsook their nets, and they followed him. And when he had gone a little further, thence he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the ship mending their nets. And straightway he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the ship with the hired servants, and they went after him. So you remember the questions that were asked? That is, who did Jesus call? Who were the disciples he called? And what was their response? So we have at least four names here. Their response is they straightway left everything, their business, their family, their father, their hired servants, they left everything and they followed Jesus. You know, Mark 1 does not have many of Christ's words recorded as we noted earlier. However, Mark 1.17 does have the words of these two fishermen, Simon, who will later be called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. The two men are standing on the shore of the Sea of Galilee and they're casting in the net. They're in full uh, focus of their business, of their earthly um, ministry, their earthly work, I should say, their earthly vocation. When Jesus calls them to a completely different vocation, one for which they're not even trained, mm -hmm. he calls them to follow him. He doesn't tell them that they need to go to school first. He doesn't tell them they need to get a degree or an education first. He says, you follow me. That's what I want you to do. That's your part. And then I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to make you fishers of men. And that's exactly how the gospel call works today. All education is important. School is important. But the most important thing is that we allow Jesus Christ to work in our life and heart so that he can make us true fishers of men. So Jesus' call to these uh, men is simple. It's direct and it's prophetic. He calls them to follow him. That is to become his disciples. He indicates that if they will respond to his call, he will take on the task of making them fishers of men. And this is so important for us to understand because many times we are not able to be taught of Christ because our minds and our hearts are so full of this world and the things of this world. Jesus wants us to become humble learners, recipients of the truths that he wants us to teach. So let's ponder why these men would immediately leave everything and follow Jesus. I mean, they just left everything and followed Jesus. Did they even know Jesus? Were they even acquainted with him? Did they have any kind of understanding of who he was? I mean, for them, just did, did Jesus come by as a stranger and they just looked at him and then they just left and followed him? Let's look in the Gospel of John, verses 35 through 41 of chapter 1. The Gospel of John, verses 35 through 41 of chapter 1. Actually, we'll go to verses, uh, verse 42. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 35. Again, the next day John stood and two of his disciples and looking upon, now this is John the Baptist, by the way, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he said, behold the Lamb of God. So John the Baptist was the forerunner of Christ. John the Baptist is proclaiming the coming Messiah. And John the Baptist, as he's proclaiming this message, just to give you a little background here, he has disciples that are following him. He has, he has people that are following him in preparation for the message he's giving to the people. And one day he's looking, John is standing there looking, and he has two of, dis of his disciples with him, not Christ's disciples, his disciples. And he says, looking at Jesus, behold the Lamb of God. And then verse 37 of John chapter 1, the two disciples heard him speak, and they, his two disciples, followed Jesus. And then Jesus, verse 38, turned and saw them following and said unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, or be interpreted, Master, where dwellest thou? And he said unto them, Come and see. And they came and saw where he dwelt and abode with him that day, for it is about the tenth hour. Now one of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. And he first finds his own brother Simon and said unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. So what does this bring out? Well, it brings out the importance of influence, the importance of our ability to influence others in a certain direction. 
Simon and Andrew were influenced by John the Baptist. They had spent time with John the Baptist. And when John the Baptist proclaimed, this is the Lamb of God, this is the Messiah, the influence that they had, that John the Baptist had with them, influenced them to follow Jesus. And of course, as they spent time with Jesus, they began to realize indeed this was a special person. And we see this happening all through the Gospels. We see the influence, the impact of influence. Now, part of the influence here was Andrew and Cephas, or Peter, they were brothers. And of course, uh, Peter was influenced by Andrew, his brother, and believed what he had to say about Jesus. So we find the importance of making friends for Jesus, having this connection with people so that we can have that influence upon people. Obviously, this influence was valuable when Jesus comes in Mark's very short description and calls them, they had already been impacted or influenced by their relationship with John the Baptist and of course, by their relationship with each other. So the Gospel of John kind of fills in this picture more fully. It seems that the brothers were followers of John the Baptist, and as they heard his proclamation of Jesus, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, they followed Jesus. They met Jesus, they spent time with Jesus near the Jordan River, and consequently their acceptance of Jesus, the call to ministry was not some uh, lark or escapade. They had thought this through. They had had connection with John the Baptist. They had had connection with Jesus and they were responding to more than just the call, but to their, the influence that they had had with these different individuals. But why does John Mark uh, not fill in these details? You know, why don't we find these details in, in the Gospel of Mark? And this is why it's so important for us to compare all of the Gospels because they fill in the details and they give us the broader picture. Well, it's likely because his emphasis is on the power of Jesus. Oh, he calls and the willing fishermen answer and they drop everything and they follow him. That's the influence, that's the power of Jesus. He just, they just drop everything and follow him. But we see in the background, we see in the details that there's more to it than just that call. There's relationship that is developed. And it's very important for us to not only have the power of God and the influence of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we do ministry, but also to develop relationships with people. People, to know people and to have people know us in such a way that our words have something behind them. That we're not simply speaking words, but we have a relationship and connection with people. So when you think about though them following, uh, following Christ and letting go of everything on this earth, the question that comes to mind, at least for me and perhaps for you is, what is God calling us to give up for Jesus? What is he calling us to leave behind? And it seems that at every stage in our Christian experience, at every stage in our walk, God is gonna call us to a higher calling, call us to a higher level of commitment, and call us to walk away more and more from the things of this world. And that's gonna happen as we develop that closer and closer relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Rafferty. Uh, I am Daniel Perrin and I have Monday's lesson, which is called an unforgettable worship service. Now, you have to decide for yourself whether or not this truly is unforgettable. If you go through this experience, would you ever forget it? Decide for yourself. Uh, the text begins in Mark chapter 1, verses 21 to 28. And I'm going to read the whole text with you right here. I'm in the New King James Version. Then they went into Capernaum and immediately, there's that word again, on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and taught. The synagogue would be the church, what we would call the church today. And they were astonished at his teaching for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Now, there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit and he cried out saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him saying, and here's one of those places where I'm not sure how to read this with my voice because I don't know what Jesus' tone of voice was like and I would love to have heard it. Uh, it says, be quiet. The King James Version has these three words, hold thy peace and come out of him. When the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him. Then they were all amazed so that they questioned among themselves saying, what is this? 
What new doctrine is this? Doctrine is a word that means teaching. For with authority he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And immediately his fame spread throughout all the region of Galilee. And this is not with text messages or letters or anything like that. This is just word of mouth. So Jesus here is introduced, he's baptized, he's tempted, and he's victorious. And then he begins calling disciples that he will train. And then he gets down to work. Do you like that? I like that. No, no standing around waiting for instructions. No forming a committee and a subcommittee and putting in an application to get through bureaucratic red tape. Now, let me be clear. There is a place for divinely led committees. They're important. But Jesus works. And what is his work? He fights, the, he fights against the enemy and he casts out the unclean spirit. He rebukes the spirit, it says in verse 25 there of Mark chapter 1. And this is the same word rebuke that you will read in Jude chapter 1, the only chapter, verse 9, where Michael, the archangel, who is Jesus pre-incarnate, before he is born uh, as a, a human, he rebukes Satan and raises Moses, who had died, to life. All right, so here Jesus rebukes Satan and gives new life. And this first work that we see in the book of Mark is the very same thing, giving renewed life to a suffering man. And so there's good news here. Jesus is mightier than Satan. Amen. The end. All right, <laughs> well, we got a few more minutes, so we're going to go a little deeper here. There's something else we need to notice, and that is the location where this happens. Did you catch it? It's in the synagogue. This is Satan with his desire to bring into the church distractions that, that turn the mind away from Jesus. Jesus is teaching the people. He's looking in their eyes and seeing what they need and giving the perfect words and the, the, the gracious illustrations divinely suited to meet the needs of every individual there. And so what happens? Well, maybe you've had an experience like this before. I know I have where you're preaching and you're about to make an appeal. Then there's that, that watch starts beeping or there's a clatter or somebody gets up and rushes out with a bloody nose or, you know, it could be a whole number of things. Somebody stands up and, and, and walks down and is frustrated about something. The devil loves to distract the mind in the worship of God. He does it with that cell phone all the time. Mm -hmm. Or, or looking at that brother or sister and how they're dressed. Or you're frustrated with that brother or sister or the pastor and, and you're having a hard time thinking about the message. Or we're hungry or we're tired, whatever it might be. And then the service ends. And instead of sitting and, and pondering and thinking about the message God has just placed before you, we rush off to a conversation or we rush off to eat. The enemy loves to distract us from the word of God. So let's commit ourselves right now, this next Sabbath, this Sabbath, and every Sabbath to follow. Say, Lord, when I enter your house, uh, put a protection of angels around this space and around me so that my mind will not be distracted and I won't be a distraction to others. Because when we meet God in his house, it's holy ground. Mm -hmm. uh, the book, My Life Today, page 286, calls God's house on earth, the gate of heaven. And so by God's grace, uh, we want to also do the work of putting away those distractions. But look at this distraction. It's a demon-possessed man. Satan had led this person here not only to distract, but to show how firmly under his control he had humanity. And let's talk about demon possession for just a few minutes here. Uh, here is a person who has a family. He has a mother who gave birth to him and fed him and cares for him. He had a childhood, perhaps childhood friends. And this is someone of whom Jesus says, before I knew you in your mother's womb, before I formed you in, your, in the womb, I knew you. Mm -hmm. Jesus cares about individuals and their suffering, even if it's 100% self-induced. And their cry moves him to action. Amen. Now there's two kind of influencing powers in our lives. The Holy Spirit, 
abides in the heart and works with our cooperation to uh, place our will on the side of God, to do what he would have us to do. And this brings our will, which is our sovereign deciding power, into united effort with God's will. And this leads us to a sound mind. Now, on the other hand, there is another force. The opposite is true of an evil, unholy spirit. When we persistently resist the promptings of the Holy Spirit in our mind and our thoughts and through the word of God, then we yield ourselves over to the promptings and the will of Satan and his angels. And our character then comes to begin to resemble his character instead of God's. Now, the further we separate ourselves, the further we respond to those promptings and the will of Satan and, and, and reject the influence of God, the more firmly then will our mind be influenced by Satan until, until ultimately we are under the grips of demonic power that we cannot break free from on our own. And I want to emphasize that this is a gradual process. It doesn't happen in a moment with one thought, one decision, one event, but it is the result of living out of harmony from God's will. And the healing God desires here is to bring you back into harmony with God's will, not just to cast out an influence and a spirit, but to bring your decision-making power back into harmony with God's. This man must be helped, and that help cannot come from himself, cannot come from man. Now, I have to emphasize here that when Jesus casts out the unclean spirit, the man is convulsed. Uh, whatever that might look like, there is no casting out of Satan's influence without a tumult and a convulsion in the physical, perhaps, and definitely the spiritual life. Don't think that you are going to turn away from uh, the, the habits and the influence of Satan without some kind of shaking because he does not want to let you go. As you put your will on the side of God's, as he prompts you and gives you ability, your friends might look at you as if you're crazy. Well, why, are, why are you stopping doing that? Why are you turning away from that? And to be honest, you might go through withdrawals from something or cravings for something, and you might have tears or pain. This is a part of the process. It's divine surgery. God does not give us a new heart without cutting in and taking something out. And there's, there's a process involved there. Now, the people here are amazed at what happens. Why? Because Jesus' teaching had power. And they'll be amazed at our teaching when it has power because it is from the word of God. Now, no, we don't need more opinions. We need a firm, thus saith the Lord, God's word that transforms our lives and is evidenced and, and given illustration by the lives we live. Right, that's the power the world needs right there. And then they're amazed because Jesus' healing methods work. He was a medical missionary. Mm -hmm. A medical missionary simply gives illustration in the physical world to what God wants to do also in the spiritual world. We are to find hurting people of all kinds and all sorts and share with them the simple remedies united with God's power that bring divine results. And this is within reach of anybody who can take the, take the simple methods of restoring health and then put those into effect with prayer and give all the glory and praise back to God. And this is what Jesus illustrates for us. Amen. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. We are in week number two, a day in the ministry of Jesus Christ. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Ever wish you could study more deeply along with the three Abian Sabbath School panel members? Well, now you can. Just send an email request to ssp at 3abn.org and we'll email you the Sabbath School panelist notes on a weekly basis to enhance your own study of God's Word. That address again is ssp at 3abn.org. We'd love to send you their notes just as they've prepared them. Thank you for watching and thank you for being part of our 3ABN Sabbath School panel family. Welcome back, friends. We are on Tuesday's lesson with Sister Jill Morconi. 
Thank you so much, Pastor James and Daniel. What an incredible study as we look at the call of the disciples and then this uh, opening day, as it were, as Mark describes Jesus' ministry there in Capernaum. On Tuesday, we look at more Sabbath ministry and we're on the same day that Daniel talked about, that Sabbath morning, but now we go into the afternoon and we look at how Jesus continues his ministry. And we have six takeaways from Jesus example of ministry from the verses I have, which is Mark 1, 29 to 34. We're going to get six takeaways. Mark 1, verse 29. Now, as soon as they came out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So these are the disciples that had been called that Pastor James talked about. And they just came out of the synagogue. They just finished that amazing worship experience where Satan was cast out and where Jesus spoke with authority. Now they enter the home for some food and fellowship. Takeaway number one, ministry is not always seen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you and I think that ministry has to be done from the pulpit. Ministry has to be done with an evangelistic series. Ministry has to be done when we give Bible studies. And those are all ways of ministry. But Jesus is continuing his ministry in the home a private setting with his disciples and the host, spending time in food and fellowship for you and I. Ministry can be in the home with your children if you're a mom or a dad, with your family. Ministry is visiting people who are sick or discouraged or in prison. Ministry is praying for other people. Ministry is writing cards and letters. Ministry takes many different facets and forms. Let's keep going. Verse 30. But Simon's wife's mother, this is Peter's mother-in-law, lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So get the picture here. Jesus is thinking, I had a full morning. There was a lot of ministry outward, public ministry going on. I'm looking forward to some private ministry. Now, I don't know if we have any introverts at the table or any introverts watching, but sometimes ministry can seem all-consuming when you're with people all the time in the public and thinking, oh, I'm going to the home now and we're just going to have a private time here of ministry mm -hmm. with food and fellowship. And now there's an interruption. Another healing needs to take place. Takeaway number two, ministry happens at unexpected times. You and I need to be willing to surrender our plans to God. You know, when I wake up in the morning and I say, God, I give you my day, and I really mean it. And then I get going in my day and God says, hey, Jill, I need you to set your list aside. I need you to set aside what you thought you were going to do. And right now, I want you to minister over here. And you know, sometimes I'm not as willing to surrender because I say, but I had this to do, God. Didn't you know this was important? God knows everything. Ministry comes up at unexpected times and you and I need to be willing to surrender. Sometimes it hurts as Daniel talks about and say, yes, God, I want to do things your way. Keep reading verse 31. So he, this is Jesus, came and took her by the hand. She's sick in bed there, Peter's mother-in-law, and lifted her up and immediately the fever left her and she served them. Takeaway number three, ministry begins after we are healed. She was sick in bed. She couldn't serve them. She was in bed. She had a fever. She couldn't prepare food and serve them. She had to be healed first before she could effectively ministry. That means that you and I need to find Jesus. You and I need to discover who Jesus is before we can effectively minister for him. Now, I know that the rocks could cry out. I know that a donkey can talk. I know that uh, Balaam went with the intention of cursing Israel and ended up blessing. So you could say, okay, God can use anyone at any time for his purposes. Yes, that is true. But I think ministry is much more effective when you and I are healed, when you and I have met Jesus and experienced him for ourselves. Mm -hmm. I think of 1 John 1. I love this passage. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 to 3. Keep your finger in Mark. We're coming right back there. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, that means to give in the audience of. 
which we have seen with our eyes. That means to gaze with wide open eyes, which we've looked upon. Our hands have handled. That means to verify by touch. Concerning the word of life, jump down to verse three. That which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship, that word koinonia, spiritual intimacy, oneness, fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his son, Jesus Christ. So what is John saying? He's writing to the second generation of believers, as it were, those who didn't walk and talk with Jesus. And he's saying, I was there on the Mount of Beatitudes, as Pastor James referenced, I think, in Matthew. I was there and I heard Jesus say, blessed are the poor in spirit. Mm -hmm. I was there and I witnessed Jesus cast the demons out at the synagogue in Capernaum. I was there in the boat when it was wave tossed and Jesus stood up and said, peace be still. In other words, I experienced Jesus. What I know, I'm declaring to you. So you and I are called to share what we have known and seen and experienced with Jesus. Takeaway number four, we're still on the same verse there in Mark 1, 31. Ministry involves service. So Peter's mother-in-law, she was healed, and then she got up and what's the word? She served them. That word service literally means to wait at tables. It's the same word used of uh, the angels in Mark 1, 13. When they came and ministered to Jesus, they ministered to him. It's the same word used of the deacons in the early Christian church when they were called service. Ministry involves service. In Mark, the model of the true disciple is someone who does lowly service, someone willing to serve. Let's keep reading. We're in Mark 1, 32. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Takeaway number five, ministry, it promotes itself. Now, I'm saying this tongue in cheek. Jesus was not at the synagogue service that morning and saying, okay, did you see me just cast out the demon possessed man? Did you see me heal that man? Come tonight. Make sure you come back tonight because you're going to see some more amazing miracles. Do you think Jesus said that? Mm -hmm. No. They spoke as one having authority and they were astonished at his teaching, his life, his character, the miracles that happened, that promoted itself. In other words, the anointing of the Holy Spirit residing in him, that's what impressed people's hearts and minds. And they said, did you hear what happened? We need to come, we need more. Ministry promotes itself. Verse 34, Mark 1, 34, then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons and he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Takeaway number six, ministry cares about others. I don't know about you, but Jesus had a full day. He was preaching in the morning. He was casting out demons. He was healing people in the afternoon. He was ministering to his disciples. And now the entire city gathers together at the door. And yet he still extends himself. He still seeks to serve. He still cares about others. Here's a quote from Desire of Ages, page 259. Hour after hour, they came and went. This is talking about that night at Peter's house in Capernaum. For none would know whether tomorrow the healer would still be among them. Never before had Capernaum witnessed a day like this. The air was filled with the voice of triumph and shouts of deliverance. The Savior was joyful in the joy he had awakened. As he witnessed the sufferings of those who came to him, his heart was stirred with sympathy and he rejoiced in his power to restore them to health and happiness. Not until the last sufferer had been relieved did Jesus seek his work, cease his work. It was far into the night when the multitude departed and silence settled down upon the home of Simon Peter. The long, exciting day was past and Jesus sought rest. But while the city was still wrapped in slumber, the Savior, rising up a great while before day, went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. If I were to give you a seventh takeaway, I told you there's only six. If I were to give you a seven, which is just starting to step over into Shelley's day here, it would be this, ministry knows its source. In other words, mm -hmm. you and I, 
cannot continue to minister. We can, without, we cannot minister, period, without going back to God daily, moment by moment, seeking to be filled with the Holy Spirit, spending time in prayer in His Word, knowing that we cannot effectively minister for Jesus until we go back to the source, and that is the Lord Jesus Himself. Thank you, Jill and Daniel and James. This is a beautiful lesson. If you could sit down and talk to Jesus, what might you ask Him? What was the secret to your success, Jesus? Mm -hmm. Wednesday's lesson, I'm Shelley Quinn, is the secret of Jesus' ministry. We're going to begin with Mark 135, immediately the verse after Jill's. Mark 135. Now, in the morning, this is after that long Sabbath of he was ministering late into the hours of the evening. Now, in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. Surely he'd been exhausted by the Sabbath events that, that had happened, mm -hmm. but he slept just a few hours, and then he arose a long while before daylight, so it's still dark outside. Mm -hmm. But more important to Jesus than sleep was a face-to-face -face communion with his father. He got up, he went out, he departed. The lesson says, says this, these verbs, the tense of these verbs are a completed action. Got up, went out, departed. He didn't hit the snooze button. <laughs> he then, the focus of the passage is that he was praying, and the verb to pray here is in the imperfect tense, which means it's a continuous action. So he prayed and he kept on praying. This was an extensive time of prayer. You know, often Jesus withdrew from others and he would go to some solitary place to pray privately and earnestly. So to me, there's no secret to the success of his ministry. It mm. came from communication with his heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. You know, Jesus said, I have come to do my Father's will. I only do what he tells me to do. I only speak what he tells me to speak. Mm -hmm. So he humbled himself. He became a human. He came in our likeness and he did something that we have to do. He depended totally upon the Father and upon the leading of the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was a person of prayer, a person of thanksgiving and praise, a person who, when there were anxious moments, he was troubled. He prayed earnestly and he interceded for others. Now let's look at Mark 136. So here's Jesus out praying. It says, Simon and those who were with him searched for him. In the Greek, they were eagerly looking for him. And when they found him, what did they say to him? <laughs> Everyone is looking for you, Jesus. This suggests that they want him to come back and capitalize on the events of the day before, the prior evening. They're, they're ready for him. Come on back, let's do some more healing. This is good for your ministry. Man, the word is out. What does Jesus say in Mark 138? He said to them instead, let us go into the next town that I may preach there also, because for this purpose I have come forth and he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all of Galilee and casting out demons throughout all of Galilee. Here's the thing that I want to point out. Jesus was very clear 
about his mission. Mm -hmm. He did not get sidetracked from his primary mission. Mm -hmm. I remember once um, a conference president, I was speaking at a conference camp meeting in Texas, and I was talking with this gentleman afterwards and telling him, oh, I'm trying to, I was trying to write 10 commandments twice removed, but I had so many calls coming in. And this man said, I was telling him all of these things I was doing. You know what he said to me? Oh, the devil is so happy with you, Shelley. And I said, what? <laughs> and he said, oh yeah. He said, you're doing good things and you're giving up the best thing. Yeah. So see, it's interesting because we can, we can't be all things to all people. Mm -hmm. Jesus could be obviously, but he was very clear about his mission and he never got sidetracked. So throughout the gospels, we see Jesus is a man of prayer. Let's look at Luke 6 and verse 12, Luke 6 and verse 12. Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and he continued, how long? All night. All night in prayer to God. Have you ever prayed all night? Mm. Oh, we've had some good prayer meetings where we prayed all night. I've spent many a time where you were concerned and you prayed all night, but Jesus prayed often and he prayed long, particularly when he had a major decision coming up. And in context here, he's about to choose 12 apostles from the group of disciples. He never did anything without checking with his father. Let me ask you, if this is the example that Jesus left for us, if Jesus prayed this much, how much do you think we ought to pray? Yeah. So now let's get practical. How often have we uttered the excuse, ah, I'm too tired to get up and pray. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have we been healing all night long? Mm -hmm. Did we do what he did? We need to get up and pray. Turn your phone off. Amen. When you wake up in the morning, turn that phone off. Declutter your mind, seek God. God has promised you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. It can't just be, oh Lord, bless this day and out the door you go. When you feel exhausted from your responsibilities, when you're depleted of your energies, Go to God and say, fill my cup, Lord. This is how we get re-energized, reinvigorated. I like to seek him early and I'll tell you why. I love Psalm 63 verse one. David says, oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. What I have found, if I don't seek God early, I can get into the rhythm of the day. Yeah. I can get going and you're working so hard that it's kind of like, oops, Lord, yeah. I'm not depending on you. But what I like to do, and I just encourage you, we don't want to prayer to be rote, but there's something about starting with thanksgiving and praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. You can have a down in the mouth attitude. You can be thinking, well, why me, Lord? Why am I suffering like this? And you start thanking God and guess what? He lifts your heart and you become aware of your blessings. You can start praising him and it reminds you all things are possible with him. He has all power. So this remembering his goodness and his love and his power is important. I always make a prayer of consecration. I always ask the Lord mm -hmm. to fill me afresh with the Holy Spirit. That's probably one of the first things that comes out of my mouth in the morning yeah. and, and say, Lord, do with, with me today what you will. An interesting note, I've got to hurry now. Many, this is from, this comes directly from the adult Bible study guide. Many Christians have set times for prayer. It's a good practice. It's right. 
but it can also become a routine, almost something done by rote. One way to break out of it is to change your time of prayer, occasionally pray longer than usual. The point is not to lock yourself into a formula. I'll tell you what I found the most helpful. Learn to practice God's presence. Learn to talk to Him throughout the day. Remember, He's right there with you. You get in the car, turn the radio off, talk to God. I'll tell you the secret to success. Communication is the relationship. Speak with God and he will give you the same success he gave Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Turn them phones off. <laughs> Turn them off so you can hear the voice of the Lord. That's a, such a, that's a, that's a blessing, actually. I've, um, I've uh, often forgotten to do that. And uh, people will call you in the wee hours of the night. Mm -hmm. And I actually turned, left it on one time purposefully because I was witnessing to someone who was having in in severe panic attacks in the middle of the night. And so I left it on on purpose to pray for someone in the middle of the night over the phone. So it can be a blessing, but it can also be uh, so not so much a blessing. So, My name is Ryan Day and I have Thursday's lesson entitled, Can You Keep a Secret? Some of us struggle with that. And, uh, but Jesus, uh, some people, as we're going to see here in the Bible, we see many, many, many cases, uh, Jesus told people, don't go tell anyone. And what did they do? They ran right off and done what he told them not to do uh, because of their excitement and joy and what the victory that Christ had given them. So we're going to go to the latter verses there of Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45. We're going to read here where Jesus, uh, again, just a perfect, beautiful example of how Jesus treated those that were marginalized in this particular society. And of course, this is one example here in the leper that he's going to cleanse. So Mark chapter 1, verses 40 through 45, it says, Now a leper came to him, imploring him, kneeling down to him and saying to him, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus moved with compassion, stretched out his hand and touched him and said to him, I am willing, be cleansed. And soon as he had, as soon as he had spoken, immediately, there's that word again, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And he strictly warned him and sent him away at once and said to him, see that you say nothing to anyone, but go your way, show yourself to the priest and offer for, for your cleansing those things which Moses commanded as a testimony to them. However, he went out, of the, went out and began to proclaim it freely and to spread the matter so that Jesus could no longer openly enter the city, but was outside in deserted places. And they came to him from every direction. And so this, because this man went and told and done exactly what Jesus told him not to do, it kind of pushed Jesus out of the city. Now we're going to talk about this because this man had leprosy. Now, if you look, if you do any research on leprosy, it's a horrible horrible skin disease. And actually, if you do a deep research, which I think the lesson brings out that leprosy in the biblical days, there were many different types of skin conditions that could fall under the category of leprosy. So sometimes when we think of leprosy, we think of it the, 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 the most extreme cases. And it didn't have to be the most extreme cases. It could have been just a, you know, just a slight skin rash of some kind. But in this society, people with that were considered unclean and they were outcasted and they were considered to, they had their own little villages and own little uh, separate places that they had to stay away from everyone else. But look at the love and the compassion of Jesus. Jesus did exactly the opposite of what his culture uh, stood up for. Uh, and he went to these people and he was not ashamed to, to do exactly what he needed to do. Jesus looked beyond the people's faults and their conditions and he saw their need. He did not show any prejudice or disdain for those of an unpleasant or off-putting appearance. He did not hold to the popular and common belief of the day that this man's ailment must have been brought on due to his sin or, or being shunned by God. He was moved with compassion, as the Bible says, and simply treated the leper as he would want to be treated. He followed the counsel that we find right there in Matthew chapter 22, where we see there in, in verses 37 to 40, he said, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, mind and soul, and with, all, and, and with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. What does he say in the second? The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus treated 
treated others the way he wanted to be treated, as we should treat others the way we want to be treated as well. First John chapter 3, verse 16 and 18. These are just some references to establish the fact that we need to be more thoughtful as Jesus was to not necessarily treat others as the culture or as the society may treat them because we know the world treats people one way, but Jesus calls us to treat each other another way. First John chapter 3, 16 to 18, it says, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us and we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. It says, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So uh, words are one thing, but Actions uh, certainly back up those words, and Jesus did that. When you when you do a general research or definition search of prejudice, uh, prejudice is simply a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. And of course, the Jews, especially in this particular time that Jesus is uh, is ministering in, the Jews and especially its leaders were an extremely prejudiced people. Uh, Jesus knew that his bold and politically incorrect actions, if made known too soon, would lead to a would lead to greater challenges in his mission. And so there's a lesson to be learned here. I want to, I just want to speak on this for a second. There's many different reasons why Jesus told uh, people not to go. And, and I've I questioned this for years when I would read these texts. I would say, why, do you, what, why did Jesus tell him not to go tell? Like, shouldn't he be, be excited about, you know, spreading the message and letting people know maybe more people would come to receive him better if they knew? Uh, not necessarily. You see, God sees everything. He knows everything. He hears everything. He knows the heart. He sees the end from the beginning that we see things we can't see. And so in this case, the lesson brings out clearly that, for instance, here, um, you know, throughout the gospel of Mark, Jesus stands as a defender, as we see here in this particular, uh, particular passage here, a defender and support of what Moses taught. We can see this in Mark chapter 7, verse 10, Mark 10, verses 3 and 4, Mark 12, verses 26, 29 to 31. Uh, but of course, during this time, you would think it would have been opposite, but the Pharisees, while they very much stood strong for the law and very much strong for, for tradition, Actually, we see many examples in Mark 7, Mark 10, Mark 12, uh, where we see the, the Pharisees subverting uh, uh, the original intent of the teachings given through Moses. So Jesus often was, would be in contrary to their traditional expectations and their traditional teachings. Now, when he was out there preaching and teaching all these things, and in this case, going and actually touching lepers and doing the opposite of what the, the, the Pharisees were teaching, this put Jesus in a very potentially detrimental state of his witness not being able to reach as far in amount of time. It's important that when we witness to each other, when we're witnessing to others, we're careful who we witness to, depending on the situation, how we witness to them, and, and when we witness to them, and what information we share. And that we're learning this here. For instance, in Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 through 40, Jesus says these words. And, and this should, uh, excuse me, this is not Matthew 22, I'm sorry. John chapter 16, verses 12 to 13. John chapter 16, this is the chapter where Jesus really expounds on the Holy Spirit. Remember in John 14, he says, you know, I'm, I'm going to leave you, but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to send another comforter. Uh, well, right here, he brings it up again in John 16. And notice what he says to his disciples and to those followers and those people that were listening. He says, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. That's Jesus. Jesus saying, look, there's things I want to share. You're not ready for them. You're not ready to hear them right now. You're not in a state of mind or in a state of, uh, of being right now that you can receive the things that I know that I really want to share with you, but I can't share those things right now. You're not spiritually prepared for that. Uh, but he goes on to say in verses 13 and onward, however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, in other words, there is going to come a time when the Holy Spirit comes, it says he will guide you into all truth for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to Come. So Jesus is, again, just another example uh, similar to what we're seeing here. Hey, don't go, go, don't go, go tell a bunch of people that I've done this because you go out here and blab your mouth to a bunch of people. That's going to make it difficult for my mission and what I need to accomplish in this area, which we see clearly because the man did not obey, it forced him outside and they have to go away until the, you know, the, the, the heated temperatures died down a little bit of what was happening there. There's a lesson also to be
be learned here through evangelism, page 446 for us in the church today. I'm going to read this and it's a powerful message. It says in laboring in a new field, do not think it your duty to say at once to people, we are Seventh-day Adventists. We believe the seventh day is the Sabbath. We believe in the non-immortality of the soul. This would often erect a formidable barrier between you and those who, wish, who you wish to reach. There's appropriate times, yes, to share this message. You have to be careful. There are people out there that are prejudiced against Seventh-day Adventists. In fact, you know, not to bring up something negative, but it's true. You could just go to YouTube oftentimes and see people that make negative remarks. You Adventist and you Adventist. There's people that have prejudice towards Seventh-day Adventists. And so I am very much not ashamed of who I am. I am so happy and thankful. I praise God to be a member of the Seventh-day Adventist church. But I am not quick when I'm, when I'm witnessing to someone. I'm not quick to be like, hey, let me give you a Bible study on how the Adventists view the immortality of the soul or the state of the dead. You got to be tactful when you're witnessing to people and be careful what you're sharing and how you share it and when you share it. We learned that from even Jesus here. Jesus had things he wanted to share, but he did not share them at a time that they were not ready. So also apply this same principle to your ministry moving forward because there is a time and a place for all things as we learn even from the wise Solomon. Amen. Thank you, Ryan, Shelley, Jill, Daniel. We've got a couple minutes just to close up uh, with a few thoughts. Daniel? Yes, I just wanted to say that uh, I said something about having a bloody nose and interrupting a church service, but I just want to assure you that if that happens to you or a baby cries or your, your, your blood sugar is low, you need a snack or you got to stand up and stretch your legs, that does not mean you are cooperating with Satan, but Satan does use whatever he can to distract the mind. Good clarification. I like that. Mm. Um, on Tuesday, we just look at ministry and how important it is that you and I know God before we minister. This quote from A.W. Tozer, if the Holy Spirit was withdrawn from the church today, 95% of what we do would go on and nobody would know the difference. Mm. If the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn from the New Testament church, 95% of what they did would stop and everybody would know the difference. Wow. Amen. I just want to remind you that the secret to Jesus' success, his ministry was prayer and practice God's presence. Speak with him. I talk to God while I'm doing the dishes, when I'm in the shower, before I make a phone call, mm -hmm. Lord guide this. You can just talk to the Lord all throughout the day. He's right there with you. Mm -hmm. Amen. And on prayer, I just want to encourage you to pray and ask the Lord to give you guidance on when and how to share a particular truth in the right time. Amen, man. I really appreciate everything that was shared. Daniel, Jesus' immediate gospel work, Jill, the various aspects of Jesus' ministry, gospel ministry, Shelley, the secret of Jesus' gospel ministry, and Ryan, Jesus' treatment of people in gospel mm -hmm. ministry. It's been a great lesson study. We're so glad that you joined us. Next week, we're going to be studying lesson number three, which is called simply this controversies. Maybe you have a few, so be sure and join us. Until then, may God richly bless you. Thank you.